I'll invite everyone to take their seats, make yourselves at home. Letty and Kathy will take a seat. Welcome also to those who are joining us on Zoom. A big chosen group of folks. Um, I'm going to start with me. Uh, I'm Rabbi Felicia Shaw. I know most of you in the room. I don't know who's on the Zoom room, so I don't know who's there, but uh, happy to see you. I just also came from the Brit, the Brit Mila of uh, Ari and Nina Arkazan's grandson. His name is Yehuda Nachman, uh, for those who want to know, so just so the world travels. Um, and I have the privilege of opening up this morning um, to just speak a little bit about the Jewish tradition, and uh, which doesn't call, Letty's book is called Shanda, um, which is Yiddish. Um, there are a lot of different ways that I think the Jewish tradition thinks about shame and secrecy, some of which Letty addresses in the book, particularly I think it's in chapter three, about hiddenness. And actually, in this week's parasha, we see a s really strong manifestation of shame emerge in the rape of Dina, which is this week's parasha. Um, as, as most people are, are not aware, Dina is the only daughter of uh, Yaakov, and, um, and she's Leah's daughter. And um, Leah already is carrying a lot of shame because she's the unloved uh, wife, and uh, she happens to be very um, good at having babies, which is the one thing that gives her a lot of gratitude, um, which is also another aspect of shame in the Jewish tradition is for women, most of our ancestors, by the way, women, could not have children. They were barren, which is another story of shame in our tradition and in the Jewish people that a lot of folks who aren't having children, there's stigmas around that, and it's often not addressed or talked about, but it often, for some people, carries a lot of, a lot of shame. And um, in the story of the rape of Dina, um, there are a number of things that happen that I think relate to these questions of how we carry our stories, what's told, what's not told, and what we kind of carry um, kind of in our DNA after the fact. So Dina is raped, and everyone knows that she has no voice in the story. We don't actually know how she feels, which is some of what happens in Letty's book about her ancestors, is people are locked up. Um, but they're carrying things um, that once you find out certain things, things start to make more sense. But for us, Dina is a not understood character. We make a lot of assumptions about who she is and what she's experienced. And perhaps Anita Diamond in her book, The Red Tent, we get one version of that story. But there's not a lot said about Dina. And we wonder what the shame that she's carrying, of course, anyone who experiences rape or anything like sexual assault certainly carries a huge amount of shame and if you saw the book, the uh, movie She Said, or read the book, you hear that's one of the main themes um, about the experience, which is mostly about women, but not only about women, that people who experience sexual assault um, experience a huge amount of shame. But she's silent. And by the way, her father is also silent. When ja Yaakov hears about the rape, he is silent. And so he not only does not give support, Dina essentially being locked up in a box um, because they didn't want her to go out the tape say Dina, that she went out, and they tried to keep her locked in. And we often try to keep our secrets locked in um, so they don't unfold into um, shame, actually. Then, of course, Shimon and Levi, her brothers, um, then take revenge because of the shame, which is also true about what happens in ripple effects with shame, which is we not only carry it, but then we, because it's a shame on the family, it's not really considered uh, Dina's pain, it's really considered a shame on the family, which Letty speaks a lot about in the book, about what families carry in terms of what's supposed to be and what's not. 
And that's what happens with Shimon and Levi. And actually, twice in the parasha, it says things aren't done this way. And when things aren't done this way, and you do something different, then there's shame that's carried with it. And so then they act revengefully and obviously cause a lot of pain um, on the fam uh, of Shechem and Hamor. The, they circumcise all, um, they really attack them and uh, kill uh, so many people um, from the rapists of Bina. Um, so it's a, it's a cycle. Um, so I, I guess I want to put that, this story, which is a deeply painful story, but is a deeply layered story about how we carry um, hard things, which is one version of shame and secrecy in our Torah. Just in one small way, Letty points to a number of others in the book. I want to point two other notions of shame that exist in the tradition. Um, in typically, the word in Hebrew for shame would be a, is busha. It's a busha. Um, in Hebrew, it's also lehit bayesh is to be embarrassed. Um, those are the, the notions are connected. Um, there's a lot of concern in the tradition about not shaming anyone publicly. Um, that's a huge story that runs in the tradition in the Talmud. And actually, the Talmud describes it as when people get red-faced, that they feel shame, which is something we know when someone turns red, that there's a sense of shame and embarrassment. Um, and so there's a lot of protection around that aspect of shame in the tradition, but most of it is towards publicly embarrassing someone, not the shame that people carry internally, which often doesn't manifest in their shame, in their face, but is really a secret. And then one last piece about shame I'd like to say is actually there is a positive notion of busha in the Talmud, which is to say that we're supposed to be humble and embarrassed before God. Um, that there is a positive notion about, which is not the story that Letty was telling in her book, but that we um, should feel a sense of humility and concern about how fragile and frail we are as human beings and the mistakes that we make, which essentially, according to the tradition, is a, is a um, antidote to our desire to do sin. Um, so it's a complicated notion, shame which is it's, powerfully, um, it's powerful in how we operate as people, both in how we up do things and how we choose not to do things. Um, and I think what Letty has done in her book has really highlighted kind of the layers upon layers of what we carry, of what gets revealed. And as you tell in the intro with your Rosh Chodesh group about how you, um, everyone shared their secrets. So my own family, uh, not everyone, <laughs> Maybe Kathleen didn't share her secret. Um, so interesting. So my great-grandmother, um, my mom's grandmother, um, died at, in her 30s when my Zadie was about seven. Um, she had a heart condition. And her father, my, my Zadie's father, had a, his own store, and he never married again. They had four children. And... Um, I didn't find out until I was an adult that they pretty much thought he had an Italian girlfriend who um, they had a child together, but no one ever spoke about it. And my mom, through 23, you know, the genealogy, was trying to find, because it is true, the shame of not being with a Jewish woman was not acceptable in that period of time. It would not have been allowed in his family or hectured, in a sense. And so what happened because of that understanding of how we do things as a Jewish people, um, he essentially um, was considered to be a single man all his life. All He lived a very long life, actually. And no one knew um, that he, I mean, they, it was an open secret, basically. I think my grandparents knew, but my mom didn't know. And I didn't know until I was an adult that there's this whole story about him. And I think it speaks to what Letty brings up in her book, which is we have ways we operate with assumptions as a people that then um, essentially silence people in their lives. And then we're bound to discover these things over time, which is both a liberation, but also an opening of a wound again. And so as Letty um, and Kathleen, uh, they are part, uh, long time, long time friends, 
longtime BJ members together, and it's a beautiful thing to have them here together today. Um, uh, I'm going to let Kathleen introduce Letty, and I'll just say a couple of words about Kathleen. Um, Kathleen has been a longtime BJ member. She's a civil rights lawyer, an activist sh around Israel or well women. She served on our board and actually um, was a part of BJ's uh, renaissance around social justice, around doing community organizing work here at BJ. And uh, she's a friend and a committed member of this community. And uh, I'll let her say more about Letty, but just to say both of them are icons for, uh, for many of us who are uh, generation or two below them look up to the the, s the trails that they've blazed um, that has allowed many of us, particularly as uh, women, to find our own voice because those have found it before us. So we're really looking forward to this book talk and for the two of you to be together. Thanks, Felicia. I just want to add that there is something so wonderful to me about having this in this chapel because all those many years ago, Rachel Cowan and I were the co-chairs of this uh, renaissance of social justice at BJ, and now the chapel is named after Rachel, who was a very good friend, so that's a sweet little sort of bow on it. And that's her library, right? Uh, so many of you probably know everything about Letty that I'm going to say. I won't say too much, except that Letty is, I think, the most prominent Jewish feminist alive today. Uh, Gloria doesn't always identify as a Jew, so that's uh, so that's the only competition. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. Uh, Letty was a founder of Ms. Magazine, a participant in Free to Be You and Me. She's a very prominent writer and activist and tumbler in the Jewish community. And I must say, at 84, the busiest person I know. She, I don't know how you do it. I have this list of all of her appearances. She's got like 700 appearances over this book. Uh, I also have seen her operate at close range. We will talk about why Letty documents everything. If you've ever seen her at an event or a talk, I'm surprised you're not doing it now. She's always taking notes. She has 10 million notebooks. Uh, she keeps track of who is at every dinner party, what she served, and maybe what they talked about. I don't see the notes afterward. So she's a real documenter. Uh, this memoir is beautiful. Uh, Letty revisits a number of stories that she's told before, but in this one you go way deeper. Uh, you, you retell, reimagine, not reimagine, but you not only talk about how you feel and your judgments of people, but you very fairly say somebody else who was involved had a different judgment, and you're so honest about that. I could feel your pain in digging down in these stories. So there's a lot to cover. I wish we had more time than we do. I recommend it because it's beautiful. But I want to ask you first, uh, as Felicia spoke, she talked, she used the word shame. Why did you choose to use the word Shonda? What did that allow you to do? What, did that, what does that represent that calling it shame wouldn't have done in the same way? Thank you, Kathleen. Can I be heard in the back? Good. Um, first of all, Felicia, thank you. I learned a lot from, <laughs> from your little Jabbar here. Uh, and I still have something like 30 talks to go, and I'm going to use what you said, because <laughs> um, it wasn't on my list of things to cite as examples. But perfect, perfect. Kathleen, thank you for devoting so much time to this event and for contributing the, the wonderful questions that are at the end of Shonda uh, for book groups. I said to Kathleen, I'm overwhelmed. I can't get everything done. And she said, what, what, do you, what do you have to do next? I said, I have to sit down now. All of a sudden, I have to write questions. I'll do it, she said. And she did. Um, I tweaked the, only the tiniest bit. So if you're in a book club and you're using the questions at the back of the book, thank Kathleen. Um, as far as our relationship goes, we have been close for so many years, <coughs> and I don't want to share all the reasons that we're so close. I hope you <laughs> but I will give you a clue. Um, years ago, um, I complimented Kathleen because nobody does it better when it comes to making things beautiful, making things meaningful, bringing people together, and getting her work done, and being a spokesperson. And 
she said to me look who's talking you calling the the pot calling the kettle black so from that time on she calls me pot and I call her kettle that's as much as I'm admitting okay why Shonda because um, you know, the word shame for me is associated with the Catholic friends I had as a child. Shame was shame, shame, shame. I saw their parents say, shame on you, shame on you. I never heard that. I heard, sha, it's a shanda. Constantly. Something was a shanda. Something was not to be said. Don't wander, wander into that subject matter. And I forthrightly wanted to establish this as a book about not just shame, but Jewish shame the kind I grew up with, the kind that my parents' generation defined by virtue of being the immigrant generation and needing, feeling the, the urgent need to fit in, to be perfect, to be real Americans, to not make mistakes that humiliate not just themselves and their families, but the Jewish people, and sometimes Hagad, a Hilul Hashem, a shame or a desecration of God, of the, the Jewish God herself. So, <laughs> so for me, um, shame had that power. It had a power to radiate out and mess things up for my fellow and sister Jews. So it had to be Shonda. But I hoped other people would relate to the subject matter, so it has a subtitle that's pretty direct, A Memoir of Shame and Secrets. That explains it. That explains uh, everything. I, you, uh, as I went through the book, I found that you admitted to 12 Shandas of your own. Mm. I will show you a list at some point. It's your 12th book, yeah. and 12 is your is a very important number to you. So we'll get to that. Whoa. But this is how you learn from your friends and your rabbis. The uh, 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 of your I family. Never noticed. The 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 Ur story, which you've told before, but you go deeper this time. Uh, took place in 1951 at a bar mitzvah, at a card game with your cousin after a bar mitzvah, and all of a sudden, something cracked open. Will you tell that story? Yes. Um, my cousin Simon Sargon, um, who lived in Winthrop, Massachusetts, was having a bar mitzvah. My parents and I went up there. I had, you know, no qualms about going, being there, seeing my cousins. I'm one of 25 cousins on two, both sides. My parents each were one of seven, so it's a humongous family. This was my father's side of the family. And if you had asked me that morning, you know, who are you? I was 12 years old. I would have said, you know, I'm Letty, child of Seal and Jack Cotton. And do you have any siblings? Yes, I have a sister, Betty. She's 14 years older than myself. That would be my bio, you know. I get up there after the service. We walk back to the house. See, you can picture the scene, bagels, lox, cream cheese, white fish, you know, uh, strudel, coffee, other kinds of coffee cake, up the kazoo. Um, the adults are, you know, may having coffee and feasting. And the kids are running around, the little kids. And I am really proud of myself because I'm playing gin rummy with my cousin who is 10 years older than myself, my cousin Rita. And I have just caught her with 33 points in her hand because my father, a stickler for passing along his various legacies, one of them being a really good card player, taught me how. And so, you know, I say, gin, and she's been caught with 33 points. And suddenly, you know, it's my turn, because I won, to deal. But she kind of grabs at the cards, and she flings them at me, and she says, you think you're so smart. You and your family think you're so smart. You know, of course, your mom wasn't even in my family. I was the oldest grandchild, not your sister. And she spews out all this stuff that shake my world to such a degree that, in all honesty, uh, I just felt everything go black from the sides in, and then... Next thing I knew, I, I was on the floor, and um, my parents were kneeling on either side of me, and they had obviously... You literally passed out. Literally. Liter blacked out. Everything went black. I slid off the chair, um, and the cards were all around me on so the floor. So you had no clue up until this point? Not a clue. 
but as we can get into it later, the, you know, the, the clues the, were there. The clues were all around me. The secrets were there to be seen. But you're a kid. You don't question your own reality. You're born into it. You accept it. <laughs> so my parents, for make a long story short, as my husband says, it's too late for that. Um, <laughs> so we go for a walk on the beach. They, they load me into my loading green jacket with the toggles. I don't know if you all remember if you had one of those in the 50s. And we walk along the beach and they begin to explain to me that they have lied about their past. Each of them was married before. In 1923, each of them was divorced. In 1927, other people to other people. That my sister is really my mother's daughter and not my father's biological daughter. And eventually, and you have to read the scene to understand how it builds, I just, my father admits by carving it in the sand in the family tree that he made with a stick, a circle, and he marks it, Rena. And that's how I find out I have another sister. <laughs> He's right. And uh, ne uh, my father says, I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't seen her. Um, I gave her up uh, when she was. So this is a story you knew before. But I, I wrote before. That you wrote before. Uh, but you revisited it in this book. What happened that made you decide you had more to say? Um, because I was writing this memoir, and, I, and it's my 12th book, and I'm going to be 84 on my next birthday, I figured, it, you know, this is it. I'm not sure I have another book in me. I'm not sure I'll live long enough to write another book. Mm. Um, <laughs> So I thought, I have to go back there, because not only did I write th this scene in Deborah Golda and Me 30 years ago, but I recast it and reframed it, and I made it a scene in my novel, Three Daughters. I have written about it, talked about it. I thought I was done with it. But it was kind of the original sin of my parents. When you learn your parents have lied to you, and set up a Temkin village to support it, yeah, I'm going to ask you what they went through to conceal that they had actually been married. They had been mar they were married 12 years after they said they were, and what they went through to maintain that lie. But I'd like you to tell everybody what happened that made you decide to yeah. do this to to go I, I to go through this again. Right, because I because if I'm writing this as a last book maybe, and I want to be finally honest about everything, I want to do a, a major jump. I needed to also look at it through my parents' eyes. I needed to go back there and realize the power of the Shonda tape that required this lie, that required this framework, this structure, that would allow them to present themselves in the world. They moved from the Bronx to Queens, which is like you know moving from here to Chicago, really. When you you don't, I mean, it, there was no internet. Car rides to experience cars. I mean, people didn't go between boroughs unless there was family involved. And so, you know, my parents were able to create uh, what my mother used to always call, "Let's do a clean slate." Clean By leaving slate. Rena behind. My father abandoned Rena when he married my mother, because how else could they establish that they were an original family if they had to uh, account for? a child from somebody else. They would have had to make her lie about being, you know, and where did she suddenly come from? He didn't even know where she was at that point. He had abandoned her, literally, to a, a woman who was a, a, a bit seriously mentally um, challenged. So um, this, what they did to cover up, Kathleen, I, I mean, so many of it, it's just to, to so start much. with. They created a false marriage date that they were married February 12, 1923. They were actually married February 12, 1937. This went so far, you know, in creating that the shame baked piece of it went so far as so they allowed me to make the 25th anniversary party for them when they were married for 11 years. They they allowed me. They never said a word. I put I was. 
you said you tell that when your father was honored by his synagogue, there was a little blurb about him, and it talks about how he and your mother met. At college. At college, right, which they wasn't true. They met at the boarding school where each of them had put their daughters. My sister Betty, my mother put her at this boarding school, and my father put Rena there back when uh, the divorce first took place. And that's where they met, which is if you've seen A Man and a Woman, the French film, that's more or less my parents, with a, li with, with a great Jewish overlay, that's my parents. Well, what they, went, what they went through to, through to maintain that fiction is just amazing. That tells you what divorce was, such yeah. a genre. Yeah. You couldn't be divorced in the Jewish world in 1950. So you learned a lot of new stuff. You suddenly came into possession of a lot of new information. You want to tell how that happened? Yeah, short form, if I can possibly do it. I tend to get in the weeds. Um, my granddaughter, Molly, uh, was in college at the time, and she, um, ch in a biography class, and she chose me as her live subject to do a biography of. And she's very thorough. She's a, quite a genius, my granddaughter, Molly, in case any of you happen to know her, my daughter, Abigail's daughter. And she just said, Grandma, I'm not going to do this unless you give me hands off a guarantee. Whatever I come up with, I know you're writing your own memoir, but if I come up with stuff you don't come up with about yourself, you can't not like it, you can't edit it out. So, you know, I wanted to ask you about that, because I know in your own writing you won't write about a living person mm -hmm. if you don't have their permission. Mm -hmm. So h you were going to let Molly not be bound by that rule? Um, no, but it was about me that she was making that. She not about somebody no, else? No, not about somebody okay. else. Okay, okay. No. That, that was up to her. But, you know, I didn't know what she would find. I mean, I'm doing my own research. I didn't know what she would find. Um, and in the process, she comes to my study, which is book lined and, and file cabinets. I have wooden file cabinets. and, and Organized to death. <laughs> organized to death. Um, and underneath, uh, she says, where's your childhood stuff? I said, oh, I haven't looked at that for years. Anything I don't put in the scrapbook because it's too big or it's too complicated, I shove under there. Uh, I should say, when she said I save everything and document everything, I've been married for 59 years and I have 60 scrapbooks because I started this when I, my husband and I met. And everything's in there. And it's hard to, in an Upper West Side apartment to have 60 scrapbooks, but I do. So underneath, I'm going to ask you in a minute why you document everything, yeah. which is another story, but yeah. I don't want to interrupt this yeah. one. Yeah. Well, all I'll say is that Molly said, well, get, where's your childhood stuff? And she bent down and pulled out this um, plastic shopping bag that I forgot was there, which my sister had given me, which she had found in my mother's closet when my mother died in 1955. I was 15 in 1955. Um, I was, it, it was 2009 when my sister died. My sister was 14 years older, Betty, the only one I really grew up with. And uh, she gave it to me, and she was at that point um, conspiring with herself to cause her own death. She was um, refusing to eat and then eventually refusing to drink because she had uterine cancer and the chemo wasn't working. So that meeting, when my sister gave me this, she said, um, these are, I don't know, old letters, documents. Someday I'm going to write one of these. And I took them home, weeping all the way, because I knew that was my last meeting with my sister, because she was going to stop drinking the next day, and that would be basically three, three, four days at the most. And I couldn't face this when I got home. She was up in um, at Newton, Mass. Um, when I got home, it was like midnight. I just shoved it in that bottom, bottom, bottom place really a deep cabinet. And I didn't look at it again for nine years until uh, Molly was writing her biography. Then I dumped it on the dining room table, and there were hundreds of letters between my parents, documents, citizenship papers, divorce papers, driver's licenses, everything that a memoirist or historian would consider pay dirt. And uh, it, it lengthened by about two years, the writing of this book, but I don't think, it, had I not found it, it would be as rich a book. I'm, I, I think that is true. Uh, you were 15 when your mother died. Your sister, Betty, is 12 years older than you. Uh, 
Rena came back into your life when your mother died. But I'd like you, I mean, there's a lot of very interesting characters in this book, Rena for sure. The person who comes off the very worst is your father. Mm -hmm. And uh, you learn a lot of that from these letters. So would you tell us about your father and what he had to do with... Yeah. Uh, My father um, looked a lot like Clark Abel. There's a picture in the book that will attest to this. He's very dashing, standing near his sailboat, which he named the Heaven. Interesting me, because I'm always looking for symbolism. My mother's name was Seal, which means Heaven. Okay, leave that alone. Um, anyway, my father was a, a lawyer. He became a lawyer in 1923, very unusual for a, Jew a Jewish man in those uh, days. He was a graduate of NYU Law School at the age of 23. He was also a Talmud scholar. He was a Baal Kore. He read the Torah with all the cancellation. Um, he taught bar mitzvah boys. He got his worked his way through college and law school by tutoring bar mitzvah boys. He was my bat mitzvah tutor. I was one of the first girls to be bat mitzvah in 1952 in conservative Judaism. And I was the repository of everything he had to give Jewishly because he had you know, abandoned Rena. He said he adopted Betty. I'm not quite sure. That there are no documents, and nobody remembers that he did. But it was a claim he made always. And, uh, and then myself. I'm the last chance, third girl. Okay, I'm the repository of all his Jewish learning. Um, but my father was an absent present father, if you know what I mean. He got up every day after uh, the, our dinner. We had a 7 o'clock dinner religiously. My mother would put on a fresh house dress, the 1940s and 50s housewife, perfect. You dress for your husband for dinner. She was um, a, a designer for Hattie Carnegie when she married him. She had worked her way up from being a seamstress, uh, a uh, sewing machine operator. Um, she had given up her career because um, an, a successful Jewish male in the 1950s did not have a working outside the home wife. It reflected badly on him that he wasn't a good provider. So she quit. She also had a job in the literary agency. She quit. Um, my father was very much about Israel. He left the table, the dinner table, every night to go to a, an organization and work on creating a state. This was during the Yeshuv period. After 1948, further, what he was further galvanized to work to raise money for um, the Haganah, the IDF, you know, make the desert bloom, anything he could do to create a, a thriving Israel. I was raised in a hyper-Zionist household. Israel was my, I put it this way years ago, my sibling rival. He, Israel got more of my father than I did. And my father was emotionally, I mean, odd, I, I, not odd, but contradictory in the sense that he was very affectionate. He always called me Yiddish love names, you know, Ketzela, Bubala, the whole thing. He would hug me and kiss me in the morning when he left, in the evening when he came home. But he disappeared the rest of the time. My time with him was very special. I describe it as fruit um, floating in aspic and jello, the way we used to have it in, in the, those days before we knew about really good desserts. <laughs> and, and my mother was just there. My father's events of my father's and my life were floating forever in aspic, frozen in my memory because there were so few of them. I enumerate them in the book. How ridiculous is that? What father's experiences with his children could be listed in like two paragraphs of a person's life? Were you well fathered? So I will simply close this little part of it to say I, I revered my father. I got my Jewish education because of him. I was taken seriously as an intellectual because of him. He would stay at the dinner table for an extra few minutes if I would ask him a Talmudic question or a legal question. Otherwise, he was out of there. So I learned what's important in life. Um, and uh, finally, to admit this here, it's all very painful. I have not uh, said Kaddish for my father except uh, at um, Yisker uh, on uh, the Chagim. 
because my father didn't really let me say cottage for my mother. He, uh, he banned me from counting in the minion. My father made a lot of exceptions for himself. He was very uh, halachically informed, and he found ways to excuse driving to shul because you, God wants you there, and we don't live next in walking distance. And so in the 50s, he was driving to shul, but he was parting, parking four blocks away. He was ashamed to be the person who had halachically reached that decision, which um, the Chachams of uh, conservative Judaism reached in 1952, I think. So, but throughout the 40s, he was driving to shul, but he wouldn't count me in the minion the first um, during the shiva um, for my own mother. You said they fought every night after dinner. Mm -hmm. So that ha you'd have dinner, he'd fight, and then he'd leave to he'd go fight to for Israel. And he'd slam out, and you'd hear his the car, you know, the wheels, and my mother would cry. And that was it, because my mother kept saying, can't you just stay home tonight? Let's play a game with Bunny. That was my childhood name. Let's listen to music with Bunny. I want you to look at Bunny's homework. Uh, I have a meeting. He was... Uh, he was the head. Of, he was the president of the shul for two terms, and he got a lot of, um, you know, a tremendous amount of satisfaction and praise for it. Yes, you saw in the bulletin. I mean, what came out of that, plas uh, that plastic shopping bag were all the journals from the Jamaica Jewish Center, in which my father was honored, 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 testimonial dinner and so on. My mother had a, you know, a little luncheon for herself because. She was president of the local Hadassah. So you referred to your mother's death, which was obviously traumatic. You were 15 years old. And that's when your other sister, Rena, flounced back into your life. Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> my mother was sick in bed. Um, I didn't know my mother was dying of cancer, which was, uh, you know, the C word. Illness was a shamba. Illness, mental illness, the worst. But... Uh, physical il illness, also because, partly because you want to be perfect, uh, but partly because you don't want people to not want their children to marry your children, which people worried about if it looked like there was something in your family that might be in the gene, even if they didn't know about genes. You know, they didn't know about genes back then. They just knew it was in the family. And if cancer was in the family, maybe they didn't want your son to marry their daughter. So I didn't know my mother was dying until um, February. She died in April. My father finally sat me down, gave me a cigarette. I was 15. He would never have even tolerated that I was smoking behind his back. He gives me a lucky strike, sits me down in his study. Uh, and he's on the classic, and I'm on the, his chair. And he tells me my mother is going to die probably within six weeks. Very matter-of-fact man, lawyer, just the facts man type guy. Um, so I had six weeks to have, try to have the conversation you want to have with, with someone who you is, is about to depart this earth. That's more or less, my, it was just before that that uh, Rena shows up. My mother's in bed all, every day, all day. The f I'm in my room doing homework. The doorbell rings. I go downstairs to open it, and there on the doormat outside, and this is in, we were living in Jamaica Estates at that time, and there on the doormat is this woman standing with her back to me, a thick braid, one braid down her back. She wheels around, sticks out her hand, and says, Hi, Bunny. I'm your sister, Rena. And that's how I met her. I knew she existed at this point. Don't forget, I'm 15. I found out at 12. But never knew where she was. There was no internet. N internet. You couldn't just find a person. Um, and she comes in breezy. She breezes in. Well, turns out that she is a PhD in anthropology. She's two years younger than my sister Betty. They met, don't forget, at boarding school. They were friends when they were children. Betty gave her up without a peep in order to create my parents' false front. Um, so she had a lot of baggage, a lot of resentment. But she had come back because my father was a lawyer, and she was trying to get a marshal to come and help her get her belongings away from her mother's 
uh, apartment be in the Bronx because her mother had gone off the deep end and, and was now threatening violence and was violent. And she needed a lawyer to get the marshal to uh, accompany her back to get her belongings. She turned out to be, uh, she had 180 IQ. She had done her um, thesis on in anthropology on the Machuaya uh, gypsy, tri gypsy tribe. Turns out they're up here in on Broadway. It's a Manhattan gypsy tribe. They were further up. But my sister Rena, it turns out, was adopted by the Machuaya tribe, the gypsy, by the gypsy king. And she was, I mean, it's completely out of left field. As happens in Jewish families. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly I'm in this life of scholarship and she knew Ruth Benedict and Mar Margaret Mead and I'm at a gypsy feast. I, I kind of dropped my sister Betty who at this point had uh, three children. She was soon to have the fourth. I mean because I'm 15 and I have suddenly a completely different role model. I don't have a suburban large mont sister with three children who's pregnant out to here. I have a, a woman who, with a one long braid who lives in a flat on Gay Street in the village and dresses herself off the, the uh, ironing board. She never puts anything away. Everything's on the <laughs> ironing board. So Rena was a, a revelation and a delight and so intellectual that she spoke poly polysyllabically. You know, no, no, none of her words were one, one or two syllables. So when, years later, when our, fa our father um, was diagnosed with heart disease, my, my sister Rena called me and said, our father has a um, uh, ca well, cardio, what do you call it? Jack, what do you call it when he has a heart condition? Yeah, car our father has cardiomyopathy. <laughs> I mean, this is the way you tell your sister that her father has a, had a heart attack. He had a cardiac infarction. That was what he, she said. So she was a chip off the old block, even though my father didn't raise her. So I want to I want to go to some of your shandas. All righty. Uh, the family is complicated. There is so much there is so much going on with the previous generations. Right. But there's one story that you retell again, that you retell in a very different way and with a different. Uh, a whole different valence, and that's when you were almost raped. Yeah. Right, I tell it, uh, I told that book, you're a writer, what do you have? You mind your own life. So my first book was called How to Make It in a Man's World, and it was all about my first career in book publishing, where I had a lot of famous authors, and I was their publicist. That means you take your author, you know, to the Today Show, the Tonight Show, you book them. I was also selling foreign rights. I was also you know, planting stories in, the, in all the papers and magazines. It was a really great job. I had it for 10 years in the, from the 1960 to 1970 when my first book was published. So sometime in like 19, what, 61 or two, Brendan Behan, how many people remember the Irish playwright, Brendan Behan, okay, he comes to New York because he went out to get a pack of cigarettes and he decided he would come to New York while he was out. and he. He did that. He had no clothes except what he was wearing. He did have a two-book contract with my publisher, and he had not started writing either book. And he lands at the publisher's office, um, and you know he gets an, a part of his advance. He said, "I can do it. I can do it. I'll do it in New York. I'll do it in my hotel, in my hotel room, and I'm in charge of keeping him sober." If you know anything about him. He was a serious alcoholic and a very funny one, and a poet and a playwright. And you know, a lot of alcoholics who are charming Irishmen are forgiven it because they're so entertaining, which he was. <laughs> so he's in town, and now he's supposed to deliver his book. And uh, unfortunately, he just disappears with the money. He, he's got he's got this hotel room in the Chelsea Hotel. Where else? But he, uh, he disappears completely, and my boss says, find Brendan and make him right. Um, and so I am single at this time. I live in, on West 12th Street in the village, way over, which now is so fancy. I, p I paid $64 a month for that apartment. And nobody knows where I am. I'm just telling you that because I have to find him. I have to bar hop and find him. 
And finally, I realized, you know, he's nowhere to be found, but I, I tore up some notes from the notebook that I always kept with me, and I left them with bartenders and the uh, people I figured who said they knew him, and I said, if Brendan comes in, tell him to meet me at such and such a place, because I was going to a party in the village before I had this assignment. So I knew it would be a very late night party, and I knew if he got the note, he would want free booze. Sure enough, I'm at this party, and he rumbles in. You know, at this point, he's got a rope around his belt, uh, his trousers for a belt. He's got the morning's egg stains on his shirt, and he's singing, I don't know, roll me over in the clover. But he's at the party, and I get him out. Finally, at the end of the party, I get him into a cab. I get him back to the Chelsea Hotel. He's, you know, well, he, he's teetering, to put it mildly. I get him through the re revolving door. I'm responsible for this man. He has to be at the Today Show the next morning, really early. And I'm responsible. I'm the publicist. He's not supposed to end up in the newspapers. You know, he's supposed to end up on the Today Show promoting the fact that he's here because he's writing this book and talking about what the book's about and all of that. It turned out to be Brendan Behan's New York, a wonderful book, if you've ever s read it. But it took a lot to get it written. And one of the things that it took was for me to find myself in the lobby of the uh, Chelsea Hotel with Brendan Behan. Um, I've, gotten him to, I've gotten him to the hotel. He picks up one of those heavy ashtrays, that, like bronze ashtrays, and stands at the plate glass window and says, if you don't come up to me room last, I'm flinging this through the plate glass window, and you, can, you and your publisher can deal with the aftermath or something like that. Well, I'm not paid for him to do that. You know, I'm paid to keep him on the track. So I figure, what can happen? He's so soused. But I also say to myself, you know, no one, no one knows where I am. But I say to myself, he, look at him. He's just, he can hardly, he can hardly, you know, walk. He's, he's not a fret threat. I take him to his room, thinking I'm going to deposit him right there. Instead, we get off the elevator, and we get to his door, and he grabs me, and he throws me on the bed, and that means the next thing, he's on top of me. And I'm not going to go through the scene. You can read about it, and I'm not going to tell you what happened, except to say that only because I'm Jewish am I here today as someone who escaped a, p a possible rape. You you tell the story differently now. Oh I mean, yeah, that's your I mean, your you point. you characterize it differently right. now. You're so right. You're so clear. So y that's that that's what you do in this book is is just really try to penetrate yeah. the truth. So what did you say about it 20 years yeah. ago, and what do you say about it today? Yeah, I said about it in 1970 when I wrote about it in How to Make It in the Man's World, which was a book about my career, that 10-year career, which is all light and frothy, and how you can do this and you can do that as a woman, and the world is changing. And I wrote about it as if it was, a, you know, a, a really funny, odd experience, and luckily I knew what to say, and it, I stopped it. And here's maybe what you should figure is you need a sentence that you can say that you could stop. That was the way I did. Instead of I reported it to the police, I told my the publisher, my boss, you know, I confronted Brandon, I this, I did none of that. I did what I what Kathleen is now reminding me. And that's part of revisioning. What writers do is revision, revision, re dash vision. The, the the experiences they've had it's like it's like therapy on the page another another thing that you list is one of the things that you feel a little shame about uh, is never winning your mother-in-law's love mm. so tell that story my my husband she's also a piece of work she's a piece of work i i, I was very excited for this when i uh, met my husband bert because he was a red diaper baby. Does everyone know what that is? And if there are some who don't know, are nodding, so I'll say he was a child of communist parents. He grew up with secrets. He grew up knowing what you had to hide because this was the Red Scare period. And uh, my, my mother-in-law was the kind of person who felt that she had a single-handed responsibility to make Marxism come to life 
in Brooklyn and then in Roosevelt, New Jersey. So one of the things she did was force my husband when he was a little boy. They moved to Roosevelt from Brooklyn when he was nine or ten, and she made him do to put the da Daily Work or tuck it inside the Daily News or the Daily Mirror or the Journal American, whatever was on the people's lawns that had been thrown there by the paper boy. My mother-in-law showed my husband how you tuck it in so they don't realize till they've got it at the breakfast table that they have the Daily Worker, which is the communist newspaper. He, she made my husband sit with her in the black section uh, because in New southern New Jersey in the, in the 40s, uh, it was still segregated in movie theaters. She made my husband sit with her. He would say, Ma, Ma, they don't want us here. Plus, it was the first three rows. You had to watch the movie like this, because that's where blacks were seated, you know, in the least attractive part of the theater. And she made him sit there, because, you know, it was like she went to Union Square to put, you know, literally put out the message of the Communist ma Manifesto, and she wanted to model integration with her nine-year-old son, my husband. And this is a woman I thought was going to be my soulmate. I, I mean, I, first of all, I don't have a mother anymore. I need a mother. I mean, I'm, I'm 24 when I meet my husband. And we got married six months after we met. And I thought, this is heaven, you know. I'm an activist. She's an activist. You know, I was at that point more involved, in, only involved in, in terms of the civil rights movement and, and eventually the anti-war movement. There was no women's movement when I got married in 1963. I mean, there was one, but it was nascent underground and, you know, full of wonderful radical visionaries, but not on the streets yet. And <laughs> instead, my, my, my mother-in-law uh, viewed me as the person who stole her son away from her which is kind of classic. Not the first yeah. mother-in-law to do that. Kind of classic. But the ends to which she went, she criticized everything about me, how I dressed my children. I have twin, twin women and a man, twin girls and a boy. How I dressed them, how I decorated their room, how I cooked, what I, anything I did. Anything I did was ridiculous or too much or not enough, whatever. How about what she did to a manuscript? In 1968, I was pregnant with my son David, and um, I, I, I knew I had to have a cesarean, so I had a, an appointment, because I had the twins by a cesarean. In those days, they required you to have a cesarean the second time. And I, I had just finished the manuscript of the book I talked about to you just a minute ago, How to Make It in a Man's World. Um, I didn't realize I was going to be leaving the publishing world, but I wrote a book that sort of summed up the first eight, eight years of my time there. And I left it on the dining room table when I went in to Doctors Hospital, to St. Vincent Hospital. Wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I'm telegraphing too much? No, I mean, we can, we can tell it's coming. Come, I come back eight days later, because you had to stay in the hospital for eight days <laughs> back then. I think now they push you out at two or three, even with a cesarean. Anyway, I come back, and I return to my manuscript, mind you, pre-computer. I did not make a copy. Who made copies then, you know? My mother-in-law had edited my entire manuscript, crossed things out and changed words. My mother-in-law, you have to hand it to her. She <laughs> had a trem tremendous amount of chutzpah, <laughs> right? And, 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 you know, I could say I, I, I could have admired, I did kind of admire her, the things she did. She was a nervy woman. And, you know, to come home and find your manuscript, the only copy of which, and I, it was due to be deposited a double day, like a month after I came back from the hospital, and it was a, a shambles. Plus, it, there were not very good editorial <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> My mother had a high, uh, my mother-in-law had a high school education. She was really smart, but she wasn't the greatest writer. Um, she just wanted to leave her mark. This is a woman who, you know, the, the Communist Party didn't recognize all her efforts. She was a woman, you know. She was p very poor. They squimped and saved. My son, my fa my son was raised and with a father who lost his job. You know, seasonal. He was a seasonal hat hat blocker. 
worker, hat blacker. And my uh, my husband's father, who died when, in 1958. So this woman, when I revisit this, because I, I suddenly see everything from her point of view. I see that I'm, you know, I have displaced her. Uh, my husband loves the way I dress the children, I decorate the house, the food I make. It, she sees it as negating what she was and what she did, and that the women's movement seems to be displacing the class analysis with the gender analysis, and suddenly she feels, you know, diminished. So you lash out. Uh, so of course, shall I give away the denouement? What? Yes, I want you to tell uh, the denouement. But I've meant to ask you this: What did Bert say about these, Bert, Bert this chutzpahdick mother-in-law <laughs> business? Right. Or his mother? You know, thank God for him. He always sided with me. He, he just understood this was his life now. He tried to tell his mother, Mom, that's ridiculous. Look what you've just done. How, how could you do that? Look at this. Now she has to type the whole thing again. She has no other copy. It's she, ne she never gave up. Never gave up. Until. Until. The denouement is that my husband and I happened to be the only ones at her bedside when she died. Um, one of her daughters was in... in Europe giving a paper, and uh, her daughter was giving a paper, and her son lived in Colorado and didn't get there in time. So just Bert and myself are at her bedside. And she is bald. She ha has had also ca cancer. And, and she's um, lying down, and she pulls herself up, bald and you know raspy, grabs me, grabs me and says something like, I'm not going to get it exact, but something like, I, I, I was unfair to you. I, I apologize. I treated you badly for all these years. Wow. And you know, I really wanted her to live to see if she could make good on that. But she died that night. Wow. And, and it has meant the world to me that she said that. That covers that that the smooth over a lot. Oh, totally. I, I, because I suddenly saw it from her perspective, and the fact that she could even apologize is a huge thing. Okay, another Shonda you committed <laughs> when Abby got hooked up with a Christian boy. Yes, a Catholic, a practicing Catholic. Yeah. My daughter Abigail. And what did you do, Miss Pogerman? I could not give her my blessing. I became Tevya. And, and, and it was a shock to me because, uh, you know, I, I was at the time doing Christian Jewish Muslim relations work. I, you know, I was, I was like so open minded about er anything you can think of regarding difference. And suddenly, from the kishkas out of nowhere, I, I couldn't give her my blessing I because I suddenly saw the breaking of a chain. I, I saw the line going back a thousand years that had resulted in Abigail. And she'd been raised, I mean, I, I walked away from Judaism when my father didn't count me in, but I only walked away from, in the Minion, but I only walked away from institutional Judaism. I didn't walk away from spiritual Judaism. I didn't walk away from Hamish Judaism. I carried my mother's Judaism, which was entirely home-based because she was, you know, an eighth grade graduate and she had never been educated Jewishly. But she came from a shtetl called Pilipitz in Hungary. Anybody from Pil Pilipitz? No. So, you know, I just suddenly saw all the, I, what I call these dead hands reaching out of the grave to mock me. And you, this is where it ends. This is where you're going to, this is, you, you know, that you're going to dead end your, your branch. And my daughter Abigail, we were, we have always been very close. She's very close to her twin, but she's equally close to me. And uh, her reaction was to leave. She went to um, California with the boyfriend who was accepted at Stanford Law School, and she moved there. And there was no internet. And that had to be crushing, because I know how was, close you are to it her. It was. It was like just slicing little pieces off me. But uh, as I said it re recently at a talk, I had to choose between my daughter and, th and the Jewish people. And I chose my daughter. 
So after uh, nine or ten months of her being uh, gone, I mean, we, our communications were so rare because all there was was phone and mail, and in in this was in the 90s, early 90s, or even late 80s, I can't remember exactly, and uh, it wasn't enough. I, you know, I, I, I felt the breach was painful. So I flew out to California by myself. My husband had always thought it was the wrong thing, that I let myself, let myself express something that mattered to me when this was about my daughter. See, he was very wise. And he said, if, we had, if I had said nothing, she would find out this guy was wrong for her on every other ground. I'm worried about her having Catholic children, and my husband is worried about her marrying the wrong guy. So I, <laughs> I had to reframe everything. And I really did a lot of heavy lifting in my head. And uh, I flew out there by myself. And I said to her, I will learn to love him. And however you choose to raise your children, I will love your children. And that was it. Um, and then uh, she found out he was the wrong guy anyway. She found out. She stayed, I think, another six months with him. And then she called one day and said, um, this isn't working. I'm coming back. But, you know, you characterize it as your behavior was a Shonda, and I see why you do that. But there was, uh, but having her marry a non-Jew was a Shonda in your community, and people didn't talk about it very much. No. I mean, they, w they screamed about it, but there was no real support. No, there were all kinds of conferences on Jewish continuity. Yeah. I was speaking at a lot of them. Yeah. You know, it was, it was on people's mind. They were looking at the intermarriage rates, and they were starting to care a lot about it. It became an issue in the community, a big one. But there was no support for the idea of how to handle it. No, none at all. And and I, I didn't know any intermarried couples who were like on the beam or anything like that. I mean, I thought she was going to be lost to the Jewish people and my grandchildren would be genuflecting and I would have to find a way to just, and there'd be a Christmas tree, all of which was so anathema. I mean, it was a Shonda. But for me, it was like gut level, you know. It was kishkas going on. Well, that was that's probably the biggest Shonda of the Jewish community. I was talking to Blue Greenberg recently, and when she had an intermarried couple to dinner at her house, it was a scandal in yeah. her community. That well, that was early on, yeah. and I think it was Rachel. Oh, before oh. Rachel converted. Before she converted, yeah. and look what we got. Yeah. What the Jewish people got yeah. by the pe thanks yeah. to people like Blue who welcomed yeah. Rachel. Okay, so I want uh, I want one more, and then maybe people will have a few questions. But uh, I've, uh, I think I've gone through three or four of your your sh sh Shandine Sh Shandote. Shandote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you 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 talk about your fi feeling like your brilliant career shortchanged your children, and your conversation with your children about it. And I have to tell you that when you said you dragged out your date books to prove how many nights you'd been home, I thought that was hilarious. Well, thank God I document. Yeah, well, docu doc you because see documenting it. When uh, my daughters, not my son so much, although he joined forces with them because he, he is loyal to them, <laughs> but <laughs> he somehow didn't feel it in, in the deep way they did. Uh, it's complicated as, as everything, but uh, at some point, my grown-up daughters said, you know, Mom, there were times when we really wished we had more of you. Now, that might be a small sentence to you. To me, that was a, like a death blow. I th thought I had, you know, I thought I had pulled it off, a balanced. We all did. You know, we all did. And then they grew up. And then they grew up and tell you yeah. they wish they had more of you. And, you know, I was working three days at Ms., not five. I was working long hours. I got home at 7, you know, or 6 or whatever. But I was there at night, and I was there for homework and, t you know, talking about whatever the day was like. And they were forthcoming, and I thought everything was fine, and I thought it was great that we were modeling an egalitarian marriage, that I went out, Bert went out. I came back, Bert came back. We sat at the dinner table every night at 7, and we shared our lives, and they were hearing my life and his law practice, which was interesting because he was a labor and employment lawyer, so he wasn't coming there with, you know, this tax case or that tax case, nothing. Not that there's anything wrong with tax law, <laughs> but labor and employment is way more interesting because there's human beings involved. So 
they were getting, I thought, I thought, a model of egalitarian marriage, interesting lives, family plus. I thought it was working. And they said when they con confront, I won't say confront, because they were very gentle. They were very careful about it. They didn't want to invalidate my life's work as a feminist by saying, pardon the expression, but mom, you fucked up. They didn't want that it to go that far. They were gentle and uh, uh, understanding, and they s were glad that I played the role I did, and it helped. They you know it helped their lives. But sometimes we wish that we had more of you. Well, what can you do about something you can't do anything about? You know, uh, uh, they were already in their thirties. I couldn't remake their childhood. Would, I you, would you have? Would you have? Would you have? I would have. What I would have done is made it okay to say, you know, there. If I wish we had more of you, they knew that if they said that, I would feel like feminism was a failure. Okay, you know, this doesn't work because my children need more of me. I didn't make it an open path in which to say, Mom, maybe can you figure out a way where, you know. On the four days you're home, you don't put up a sign on your door, mom working, do not disturb, which I did. When I was writing books in the middle of all those years, I did. I put up that sign, but I was there. Like, I was there if you really needed me. I was there for an emergency. You could open the door, and of course, I'm going to do whatever you ask. But they didn't want it to be that they had to knock or open the door. Or knock. If they had explained, if they had said, mom, you know that? really closes us out. Can we work a figure out a different way? I, I, I am shamed by my own insensitivity to my own behavior and my not seeing that my kids were working so hard to make my dream true, you know. They really wanted to be able to confirm what I so clearly believed in. Well, you've uh, you've you've uh, m mined that, and you you struggle with it, and I think there probably everybody in this room yeah, has struggled correct. with that, and had different versions of what you what wh what your kids said right. to you. Uh, one more question. Okay. Is there a thirteenth book? Mm -mm. I don't think so. Not that I'm su superstitious. Oh wow! Oh, that not is that such you're a lie. Are you nuts? That you're the most superstitious <laughs> person I know. <laughs> I know I am. Well, I, I, d I am the most superstitious person, you know, and I defend it on the grounds that that's pretty much what I remember best about my mother are her superstitions. I haven't given you a chance to say more about your mother. Give us a couple of sentences about your mother. Um, my mother created a, a tissue of lies to <laughs> present, and so caringly and carefully, she reinvented herself. She's a person with an eighth grade education. She had to drop out of school because her parents had seven of her you know, generation, and she had to help support them. She was the eldest. But she was ashamed to be uh, only a person with an eighth grade education. So my mother faked a, a high school graduation photo. She went to a photo studio. She went in the prop tent. She got things that made her look older, a chignon holder, a, um, a you know, bouquet of flowers as if she'd been given them, and a diploma, and she sat for a photo, and she paid for it a little bit. You know, the person in the photo studio let her pay monthly because she was making nothing. She was a person who wor worked on the sewing machine line, the assembly line. You said she said to you that she lied, or maybe this was in a letter. Yeah, this she was lied because she was ashamed of the truth. She said, she wrote, I found in the shopping bag, this is the killer, the killer document, an item that just makes me cry every single time I look at it. She was my, her deathbed note to my sister Betty, her daughter, don't forget, and it said, I lied because the truth was too hard to bear. And w among the many things she lied about is after she enrolled my sister in this boarding school that she said was the best Jewish boarding school in the country, she kept reassuring herself it was fine. She put my sister there from three to 12 years old. This is a mother who was constantly at me. Where are you? Where are you? You know, the mother I knew, the mother I grew up with was omnipresent. The 
mother my sister grew up with put her in boarding school from 3 to 12 years old. So she was ashamed enough of being a divorcee with a child that she, for 10 years, remember she divorced in 1927 and married my father in 37? For 10 years, she presented herself in the world as a single woman and never told anyone she had a child. She had a lot to apologize for, a lot to be ashamed of, and she covered for it as best she could. And when my, she met my father at the boarding school, when he was on, they both were, you know, cajoled the, the daughters, um, connive to have them both come on the same visiting day. Usually one came on Saturday, one came on Sunday. And they met up there, and when they got married, my sister was so grateful. She never resent, said she resented my sister, my mother, for putting her in boarding school. She said it was the making of her. She said, Mommy did not want me to be raised in Grandma's house, Grandma and Grandpa's household, because I would have only learned Yiddish, and I would have only heard, you know, blessings. I would never have heard classical music. I would not know how to dress. I would, everything would have been harder for me to be a real American. So she said on her, in, in my vis last visit with her, Betty, did you ever meet Betty? Yeah. yeah, you did. She said on her, my last visit with Richard her. Richard represented her, remember? Oh, <laughs> that she said that uh, I never resented mom for putting me in boarding school. It was the making of me. And then when dad and mom married, I had a real family. She was grateful, 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 only grateful. I was angry, angry, only angry. So that mother produced you. You produced your wonderful children. <laughs> Somehow it comes out right. <laughs> we don't know how. You, this has been wonderful and beautiful, and thank you very much. Thank you for preparing so <laughs> well, as you always do. We I have, have a couple we're, of we're, minutes. We're in the same Rosh Chodesh group, <laughs> and that's how she prepares for Rosh Chodesh <laughs> presentations. She brings her sources. And thank you, Pot. <laughs> thank you, Kettle. <laughs> Does anybody have a question they'd like to? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I think what she was going to follow up is on is why I document. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's a very good question, Esther. Well, uh, um, I have never been in therapy until a month ago, so so it's a very big thing for me to uh, say that on the Upper West Side that I've never been, been in therapy. But I never felt the need. Now I feel the need because uh, everyone around me is old, and I'm old, and I don't know how to maneuver being old. It's a whole new thing for me. Age is a real... Uh, <laughs> right, I... You know, I wrote Getting Over, go getting Older when I was 53. Yeah, what was I thinking? I know. What was I thinking? I would have 30 years to get used to it, and I haven't. Um, anyway, so in the process, without having a therapist, I figured out for myself, and you, I think, also told me, that I document because everything was so slippery about my own past. Well, also what your dad did after the mother died. Yeah, my father threw out everything after my mother died. He, he sold our house, he sold my furniture, he, he gave away things my mother had made, he gave away all her clothes, he gave away her kitchen things. I was 15, he said, why would you need it? I said, you know, I'm gonna grow up, I'm gonna someday have a house of my own, maybe, maybe a husband, maybe a wife. You could have put this in storage, a few things. Now that's my armchair psychology. Your father erased everything, so you have to document, document everything. everything. And I'm really glad I had those books that I could show them that we never went out at night <laughs> except. <laughs> You're not going to let that go, are you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, I, I, I like to have little, you know, pop things in there that only the very well-informed will recognize. <laughs> it gives an, it adds a layer. It adds a layer. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't, ahead, we Judy. don't, we, sh we, do, we shouldn't have forgot that date. Judy, and then you're next. Yes, I can. And you know, I, 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 I,
of it because Oh, yeah, does she talk that way? Yeah, Yeah, but Molly has had that voice since she was like nine years old. Molly is, um, uh, you know, I have six grandchildren, and I truly love them all, and they're all my best friends. Um, But she kind of has followed in my footsteps uh, a lot. And um, she's the one who wrote the biography when she was at Yale, got an A, I might add. And um, I mean, they all call me. I talk to them all. I see them all. Molly has not just a deep voice, but a very deep soul. And um, you know, sometimes intimacy develops with uh, less, fewer complications when it skips a generation. Sure. You know, it really. My grandchildren, the, my, I was thinking about my relationship to my grandchildren because Thanksgiving, they were all there. And I have relationships with each one of them that are totally uncomplicated. I mean, their lives are complicated, but our relationships are not. They would never say, you know, sometimes I need more of you. Because I'm like, I stop everything for them. I, if I got a call from them now, I would turn my back on all of you. I'm sure you would do the same in I your life. I tell people the reason to have children is grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't say enough about Molly, but they're all of them very unique. Was there something more particular you were asking, Judy? And why are you so moved by your own question? Uh, the uh, people online probably didn't hear you. You, uh, Judy, just said that the openness and the forgiveness among the three generations was very moving, and that's and she's very touched by it. At the at the event at the 92nd Street Y. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was a fabulous talk, and Letty, I've followed your career forever. You're really an inspiration. Thanks. Um, I I still have my first issue of Ms. Ooh, it must be a collector's item. It's worth about four hundred fifty dollars <laughs> if you ever but, need four hundred fifty dollars. Um, I'm I'm just uh, so struck by by your story. So much of this part I didn't know. Um, several years ago, uh, not too long before my mother died, when she was in the hospital, um, they had a birth date at the end of her bed, and I I went ballistic and said, no, that's the wrong birthday. You know, you have to correct this. And then I went to my father, and I found out that, indeed, it was the right one. She, I knew she had lied about her age, but she had told me a phony age, and she had lied more about her age than I realized. And even that small thing where I had to go and calibrate every occasion and every, like, birthday party and, you know, um, it blew my mind so incredibly that she would have lied to me even though she was lying to the world. And um, I'm also a bereavement counselor and I find out after people lose parents the unbelievable stories and revelations that come out. And without therapy, you know, how were you able, you know, with the enormity of everything you, you learned to, to keep going forward? How? I know it's a big question. But, it's uh, a big question, but it's kind of the question Thank that's you. answered best by our tradition. You know, how do, how, how do we remain uh, loyal, connected, however you want to put it, to our tradition when our forefathers and foremothers were so flawed? Because, you know, when I found out each secret and I unraveled each, you know, hidden thing or po- poser, uh, my whole, my father's whole life, he was a poser. It turned out, turns out, I, I, and I gained compassion for him. But I also thought, you know, it's not so terrible. What well, my secrets aren't so terrible. You know, what's terrible is having hidden them, the burden of them, the secrets themselves. You don't die from them. You know, it's um, it's such a tremendous relief to open up and 
let them out. I wouldn't let out the secret someone else had told me about them. But I'm talking about the things that I was ashamed of, the things that, I mean, my voice, you know, I, I don't sound, I, I, I always say my voice is, it, it, you have to realize that what it would be like to have Angela Merkel talk like a Teletubby, you know, like, like, a, like a Barney or whoever, like, like a cartoon character. And, and I, I try to be a serious person who conveys serious ideas, but my voice is, is a child's voice, or has, a, has been maybe today. I've been talking so much on the road that maybe it's a little deeper. When I hear Molly, she's going to not have that problem. Her voice is so authoritative. She has a really good rum, rumble. It, well, every time I try to do this, I get a, a sore throat. When I try to do, do that, I just it's hard. I've had voice lessons, doesn't, doesn't hold. So I think telling what you feel, even about something like a voice, or about fat shaming, or in my case, you know, I, I was skinny shamed. I, was, I hated food for about the first 30 years of my life. And so, you know, I, I was always padding my body. You know, I was always wearing thick socks and thick sweaters to look heavier. <laughs> Um, we all have our ridiculous shame-based secrets, and when you get it out there, and you can laugh about most of it, most of it, or the painful stuff, somehow or other, it gets shrunk to size. Yeah, keeping it secret is generally, you generally regret it. One more question. Yes, go ahead. That what promotion? Gossip, gossip. Lush and horror. Oh, 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 yeah. Yes, I mean, you became an outcast. It wasn't just, you know, hearing about it. I mean, you became someone finger pointed, you know. You weren't marriageable uh, if you were out in the community and you had a child. You know, I, I, I mean, you, the only ones who would want to marry you are like uh, old old men who want to be taken care of, or widowers who need somebody to take care of their children. You weren't the first choice, so it was both a practical thing to hide, and and Ashanda just in general for status. I think Lashon Hara is one of the most um, wonderful so forms of social control that's ever been invented. You know, and the seriousness with what, I mean, in the Torah and the Talmud, it's so clear that, that uh, shame is equivalent to shedding blood. I mean, God shames people who have wronged the Jewish people, right, or the Israelites. And shame is a punishment that gets inflicted. It's as bad as cutting or killing. Well, the same for Lashon Hara. It kills three people, we're, we're taught, right? So. That's the good shame part. That's the part that uh, allows us to have a conscience. There is good shame. I don't want to make us shame-free. I just want to make us lead secret-free lives. It's a beautiful book that teaches so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to um, really encourage folks to buy the book. Uh, I'm not all the way through, but uh, have it's really, really powerful. I want to... First of all, thank Ellen uh, Metzger, where's Ellen, sitting in the front row from Connections, our board member who was behind this event. Um, thank you for all your efforts, Ellen. Uh, Malcolm Margulies is uh, Letty's publisher who's here. Uh, thank you for being a part of that. I want to thank Kathleen um, for, she's an incredible interviewer, always, always. Um, and, um, and lastly, I just want to say to Letty, because Ju Judy brought up the kind of generational story, you know, in the same way that your, your parents and grandparents kept things, you've liberated them. And that's its own Torah, you know, in the sense that I think that um, a book like that, that is honest, and your whole life has been telling unliberating things, liberating women, but liberating secrets, that that is such an incredible teacher um, for all that is pent up that we have people that are willing to not only expose the world's injustices but the the personal ones because 
uh, no generation is without that. And, and I think it's very courageous, um, particularly in a book like this, to be willing to go deeper and own one's own, um, not just point fingers. And um, that your grandchildren should be deeply grateful for. Um, and I know it models for so many who would rather shut the book and not look and kind of, you know, look at 83 years, um, ad mea this reign, uh, till 120, um, and uh, think I'm done with, with revealing, um, but that life is a constant search to reveal and repair, and you've modeled that with such holiness. So thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, just a couple of other announcements. Shuli is here. Shuli Pazna, I want to thank Shuli, all those who've joined online this afternoon and not too long. At 2 o'clock, we'll be opening Dear Shuni, which is another actually feminist uh, afternoon uh, about um, looking at our tradition through feminist eyes and through uh, this incredible work of Tamar Biala, which is uh, been translated to English, so it's from 2 to 5.30. Everyone is welcome to come, uh, have some stuff in the back, and is, is the books are on sale, yes? Books are for sale. Uh, where is that happening? Right outside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, ladies, will you sign some? All right. Have a great day, everyone. Shavuot I think out there, there's some.